So our first speaker is Virginia Lafon. Hopefully I'm saying her name properly um, with my English accent. So she's a professional hypnotherapist specializing in quantum healing, which sounds very interesting, and, and an investigator and author and following the path of Dolores Cannon. If you don't know who she is, look her up. So, and if you're really not sure, I'm sure we'll get an explanation. And from the very, very beginning of her practices, dragons have been spontaneously coming into her sessions, and uh, which is amazing because I, when I first started Reiki healing, that they started coming in. And she has a, a wealth of information to share with us, a lot of it from uh, galactic history where the dragons have been speaking to her. And uh, she's also into energy healings and channeled information and works with a lot of dragon related channels. And today she's going to be sharing with us about past lives with and as dragons. So maybe you were a dragon once and the two main connections to dragons. So I hand over to you, Virginia Lafon. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you, everyone. I'm quite intimidated, actually. There is so much people from all over the world. <laughs> um, well, as you said, I am a um, practitioner in uh, past life regression, hypnosis. And uh, I've been doing this, this for the past seven years now. Um, I've learned, well, one of the training I had <clears throat> Is the OS Canon training, and this is the training I started with at first. And I didn't know about dragons at all, never heard of it as a sp as spiritual beings. I always loved them. I read books, uh, fantasy uh, movies. I loved seeing dragons everywhere, but I never really thought they could exist uh, in the sp spiritual realm. And uh, Dolores Cannon never talked about dragons. She was just not, uh, maybe not connected to them, if we could say that. Um, so, well, I came into uh, this kind of practice without knowing about dragons. And my first client, well, one of my first clients came to me and said, I want to know more about my connection with dragons. So uh, I would like to, um, to dive into hypnosis to know more about it and I was like okay well <laughs> um, I didn't even know dragon could be explored in this way so why not and we did it and it was a fantastic session and it was also a big reconnection for myself it took me about um, a month to process all the information um, that I connected with to understand that I was myself a dragon, uh, as was my clients, because, well, this guy um, was a dragon in past lives. So I just discovered that we could be dragons in past lives. And um, so it took me a month to process, to process this information and to understand that I myself was a dragon in past lives. But it was, you know, it was it. And um, I was on vacation on holiday and then I took back work and the universe started to send me more and more people that were connected to dragons, which I was not asking for. Uh, really, I, I didn't even know uh, that could happen this way. I was living in the southwest of France in a very, very small village. Uh, like 500 people in the winter living in this village. But people would come to me from all over France um, to have a session with me. And most of the time, like 90% of the time, the sessions was about dragons. And those people, my clients, didn't even know themselves they were connected to dragons. We were not talking about dragons in the interview, but they came up dragons showed up during the hypnosis session. So it took, well, it went on like that for um, months and months and well, weeks and weeks. And then I came to my colleagues and told them, uh, do you have sessions with dragons? Is there any topic yeah. that you have, um, uh, how would you say, repeatedly 
Is there something that comes repeatedly in your session, such as dragons or another topic? And they all told me no and no. No dragons, no uh, repeated subjects in the sessions. So I was like, OK, uh, there must be something to do with it. And there must be something I attract as a person and as a practitioner. So um, then I asked, well, when I first asked, it was with my colleague, French speaking colleague. Then I asked my international colleagues on the quantumhealers.com forum, um, mostly Americans. And I, told, I asked them the same question. Do you have repeated um, session with the same topic? And do you have dragons in your session? Same answers, no and no. Well, maybe dragons like once or twice, but not as I had like 90% of my session, which was um, maybe 100 session in a year. So it was a lot. And uh, then I continued to work like that. And I continued to work on myself because every session I had with my clients were messages I also got for myself. Dragons were speaking through my clients for them, but also for me. So thank you so much uh, for this. It made me understand my connections to dragons. It made me understand so many things about dragons. So uh, today I wanted to speak about um, the main connections we can have with dragons. Um, I found in my work with dragons through seven years, through now, like maybe more than a thousand sessions. Um, every human can, of course, connect to dragons. Dragons are here, as you all know, they are here as spiritual beings, light beings, uh, consciousness, everyone can connect to. Every human that desires, uh, that desires it can connect to dragons. So in a way, we are all connected to dragons, but it seems that they, there is two main connections I found in my work that are um, more, I could say that, uh, more intense and so much deeper than other, any other connection. So the first one, as I told you before, is those, uh, those dragons that decided to incarnate in a human body here right now on Earth, as you and me. Um, and it happened for thousands and thousands of years. So this is an important topic because you may know about Dolores Cannon's work. If you don't, you really should check on her. It's fascinating and you will learn so much things. Um, Dolores Cannon has written a book in 2012, um, if my memory is okay. And uh, sh the book is about, well, the title of the book is Three Waves of Volunteers and the New Earth. So she she is presenting all the sessions she had in hypnosis where her clients were talking about being extraterrestrials that had heard the call, the universal call to come incarnate in human body because at the end of the Second World War uh, with the um, atomic bomb, ex ex well, people outside uh, our, um, our planet Earth in the, cosmic, in the cosmos just thought that we were making a huge mistake and did, if we ever had our planet explode it would be a disaster for the universe, for our galaxy. So they had to stop it. And also it was time for Earth uh, to ascension, to um, evolu evaluate, evolution, sorry, <laughs> evolutionate, <laughs> would you say that? Anyway, you understood. <laughs> and it was time also evolve, thank you. <laughs> I knew it, I knew about that. Um, it was time for humanity to evolve as well. So um, people outside in our planet Earth, extraterrestrials, extraterrestrials went inside human body. They decided to incarnate in, as human body. We call them star seeds most of the time, but you know, it's uh, very subtle. I mean, it's not always as categorized as this. So Dolores Cannon talks about these beings, but she doesn't mention that dragons are the same. 
dragons are consciousness uh, beings that have heard the call and they responded to it. And so there are many, many dragons that have decided to incarnate in a human body as a woman, as a man. Doesn't matter. So in my work as a past life regressionist, uh, I found that um, my clients that are those kind of people that are dragons that have incarnate in a human body had past lives as dragons. So during my sessions, we most of the time um, travel to past lives as dragons. It could be anywhere. It could be on other planets, but also here on planet Earth. Because there was a time dragons lived here on planet Earth. Of course, it was not our dimension today. It was on the higher dimensions. For example, until the end of Atlantis, Lemuria, and beginning of Atlantis, till the end of Atlantis, but there were fewer dragons at that time. So dragons lived with humans at that moment on that dimension on Earth. They also lived on other planets. Actually, dragons can live anywhere because dragons are, uh, as you probably know, very diverse kind of of um very diverse kind of beings. They can be pure energy. They also can have a body on other planets. They can be just you know energy floating in the universe, or they can be near your tree in your garden, for example. They can be anywhere on every dimension except ours here on Earth because it's so uh, dense, so low i don't know if the words is fine but you know what i mean and if they had to come here with their body their consciousness would be like uh crashed and they would be back to um savage animals wild animals sorry so they cannot incarnate here directly as any uh, ETs, actually, they have to get inside a human body. So that's the first connection I found. And for about one or two years in my work, I mostly had this kind of people because I am myself, I am a dragon incarnate in a human body. So I found I had uh, several past lives. Well, actually, most past lives uh, as a dragon here on Earth and other planets. I myself is more connected to uh, Lyra planets, the Lyra constellation, where there are uh, lots, of dra lots of dragons and dragon riders as well. Um, second connection I'm going to talk about tonight is dragon riders. So who are they? Those people are not dragons. They can be human, they can be alien, they can be uh, avian, uh, reptilian, they can be uh, feline, they can be any type of being um, wanting to have an association with dragons. Dragon riders are uh, very close to dragons. Actually, these two connections, well, these these two beings, dragons and dragon riders, are like, it's not really this, you cannot really say with our words, with our human word, the bond is so strong. It's a love bond that is so strong. It's like a uh, parent's bond, um, brother's bond, lover's bond. The strongest bond that you can feel in your life could come quite close to what it is to be a dragon rider with a dragon. Dragon riders then are um, associated with a dragon. They are like co-workers, as you can say, or it's so much deeper than that, so much stronger than that. Dragon riders, most of the time, they help dragons to incarnate in the dimension the dragon rider is. They also take care of the eggs of dragons. They are the uh, the caregivers, 
as you could say. Um, they protect dragons. They also are here, for example, on Earth, to have, uh, like to make kind of a bridge between dragons and humanity. They are protectors and they, they have had most of their past lives, I could see in my sessions, are with dragons. Of course, we all had uh, trivial past lives. But yeah, dragon riders and dragons incarnated in human mostly had past lives connected to dragons. So it's a very, very strong connection. And most people I get in my session, when they connect to, the, to this, when they remember this kind of connection, they just cry. You know, it's so strong. It's just like remembering something that was so important and that you had forgotten. And somewhat, somewhat you're like, how could I have forgotten that? And of course, that's it. It's so strong and so natural. <laughs> Merci, Elise. <laughs> Thank you, Elise, for the message in French. Um, so what, what can I say else? It's so, it's so vast, you know, it's, so, it's a subject that it, you, I can talk about that for hours and hours. And sometimes I'm just like, okay, let's talk about that and that. that. So if you have any questions, please ask. Um, maybe I could talk about one topic that is very uh, sensitive. It's past lives during the end of Atlantis as dragon riders or as dragons that were living here on Earth with us. Um, this is probably the main topic I'm working on now for the past three or four years. Uh, I have uh, I get a lot of people in my session that go back to uh, this period um, to heal, to, to heal their wounds because there were lots of wounds, lots of trauma uh, back, back then. So as I told you, dragons and dragon riders were living together in the same dimension, in the same dimensions as everyone. Dragons were just here as unicorns, um, as mermaids in the water. So it was not the same dimension as today. And came a time when the, um, the politicians, the, the, the kings uh, wanted to have more and more power. Uh, so what did they do? They wanted to uh, chase probably not the good word, but you know what I mean? They wanted to kill, or not always kill, but they wanted to get the dragon for them so they can have their power. They could, ha they could have dragon's power. And this is the time where a lot of our um, tales about dragons date back from. When we hear that dragons um, are carrying a, a treasure inside their belly. Uh, when, well, it, it comes from that time where politicians would say, kill that dragon, and then you have the, the treasure that is inside the belly of that dragon. It was just a way to make people want to kill the dragon and have the money. And when they killed the dragon, they could see there was nothing in there, but real treasure there was in there was love and was, was the knowledge that dragon had, that dragon were here to share with humanity. So at that time, it was what I call in French, the great trahison, grande trahison. Um, what could you translate that? Great, uh, uh, sorry, what's the French, English word for trahison? If someone speaks French here, trahison. Treason, treason. Great treason, right? So dragons were really uh, offended by that. They were really um, sad about that. Lots of them were killed. It was not even killed. They were massacred, actually. And some of them could leave Earth. Some of them died here. Some of them, very few survived. Very, very few survived. But there came a time when they had to leave because the mansion was 
going lower and lower and they could not stand it with their state of consciousness. They had to live. <laughs> so most of them, unfortunately, died here. And um, today, humans that live this uh, story still carry the wounds of the treason, of the sadness, of the anger, and sometimes the wounds inside their body when they were, when they were massacred, for example. Dragon riders are also very, very um, wounded as well. They still carry also the this memory. Dragon riders most of the time tried to defend their dragons. Uh, for example, when the politicians would say, "Okay, go get, go go get that dragon. I want that dragon and in my prison," to um, to take his knowledge, take his power, take his magic. So the the police officers, for <laughs> the equivalent of police officers at that time, would go uh, to the to the place where the dragon was living with his dragon riders, with his family as well. <laughs> and uh, uh, the dragon rider would say, "No, you cannot take my dragons. I would not let you do that." Uh, and most of the time, when this happened, everyone would get killed. Unfortunately, um, some dragon riders did not have the strength to resist and were corrupted. But it's okay. When we go into that, to this kind of past life, we just understand that the, the dragon rider at that moment just did what he could or she could. And this is just what she or he could. He could not do more. He could not protect his dragon. And today, this is going to be a human that is going to be feeling guilt inside of him or her or her. So this is very interesting actually that we can heal so many wounds that go back to that time for dragons and dragon riders. So why is this really important to heal that? Because today, as you all guys know here, dragons are coming back massively. It is time for us to reconnect to dragons, to remember our bond with, with them, reconnect that humanity is intimately, strongly bond with dragons. Earth is intimately and strongly bond with dragons. It is time for us to remember our history with dragons. I often give this um, kind of example that you know, um, in French, we say that dogs are the best, uh, the human best friend. I don't know if you say that in English as well. Um, I give this example that just to give an image and just to give an understanding, of course, it's not the same, but you'll get what I mean. Dragons are the same with us. And it's like you've forgotten about dogs and one day you just find a dog in, in the street and he's so nice and you're just, oh, I love that dog, he's so nice. And someone tells you, well, you know, dogs are humans' uh, best friend. Well, but how could I forget that? Oh my God, I know now, I remember now. And, you know, makes the tears come up. It's the same with dragons. We have to remember them. But why do we struggle with that? Because of our Christian culture at first, but also so many things. And also because I consider that we are still in the Atlantis time, uh, this kind of corrupted Atlantis time, we do actually work the same thing. The politicians are not totally honest with us. Um, things are going on that we don't know about and it's, we know it's not for our greater good. It's just the same at the end of Atlantis. So also, why do religion want to make dragons being evil? Because dragons are just gods, you know. So it's just equivalent. If the religion were not scared about dragons, about our bond with dragons, they would not make them evil. It's not just... Telling, the, telling us dragons are bad, you know, dra dra dragons are not nice. No, it's not bad, it's just, they're evil. It's strong. 
So this evil is at the same level as, well, the divine in the dragons. Anyway, you all know why it's important to reconnect with dragons today, and we can heal our wounds, our memories, going back into our past lives. Well, most of the past lives I get in my session are back in the Atlantis time, but they are also in on other planets, as I said, in the Lyra constellation. Um, it appears, well, on my work, I understand that um, dragon riders could be from the Lyra constellation. And those dragon riders are, are what I call the first dragon riders. Most of them were ancient humans. We call them elves most of the time, but actually elves and human are quite the same. It's the same family. And those elvish beings were the first dragon riders. They heard the call of dragons that were kind of on another dimension or maybe on another universe. These information are not really clear yet because it's so far from our understanding, but they heard the call um, that dragons wanted to get closer to our incarnation, closer to our dimension, closer to our galaxy as we know it today. And those dragons just used the elves to come here, not here necessarily on Earth, but here on the Lyra constellation, for example. It was back in very hard to say, but probably millions of years, billions of years. I don't know. You know, in spirituality, we never really know for sure about the dates. Time is too, time is too, um, too difficult to, to talk about. Um, okay, so I hope I'm not getting lost in my in my thoughts. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Um, I'm just gonna check if there is any question in the chat. Yeah, there's quite a few questions in the chat for you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, how how do you usually do? Do you do you read them or do you want me to do it? Let's find them all where they go. There's quite been quite a few. Mm. Somebody said, uh, if we as star seeds get the vibration up to 5D and the earth is in 5D, will the dragons be able to come back in body? This is a recurrent uh, question and the, the answer is not very clear actually, but what I get most of the time is a no. 5D is still a bit too low and well actually this is not the the, um, the main answer the main answer would be that this is not the time for us human we have other stuff to live we have other stuff to go through and dragons cannot come back now and if they did come back now they were they would be killed again. Atlantis time would come back again. People would get, would get scared and um, the, you know, the governments, etc. they would take, they would want the power just as it was before. It's not the time for them to come back. Even if we are in 5D and Earth is in 5D, it's not the time. <laughs> Sorry. That makes sense. And another question, a bit of a follow up on that says, uh, so when they do come down to visit, does that mean that they are only able to do so for a short period or do they have to lower their vibration when they come here? So I think we're saying yes, they, they would have to lower their vibration. Yes, yes, they, they do. They do lower their vibration. Um, when, But it depends, actually. There are dragons that, that need to lower their vibration because naturally they are higher vibration. But there are some dragons that are low enough vibration to stick around. So it's like our guides, for example, our spiritual guides. 
you can have dragons as spiritual guides and you can connect with them all the time and you know it's it's like it's always moving actually but some dragons are low enough to stick around like for example keepers of uh, places guardians of places and um also now that i th uh, now that i think about it dragons often tell me that they are not spirit nature they are dragons <laughs> it's not the same but sometimes we could uh, be confused we can we can confuse them with being spirit nature because a lot of them are keepers of places <laughs> but they are not spirit uh, nature so this is what comes up to my mind so maybe my dragon wanted to me to say it tonight <laughs> So yeah. you can actually connect, sorry, you can actually connect with dragons anytime. And physically, probably they ha they would have to lower their vibration, but telepathically, no, they can stay where they, where they are and just stay where you are and still talk telepathically. Yeah, that, that makes sense because I've only ever once in, in my experience with dragons met one physically and it was see through and it was it was it was uh, more ethereal and almost water dragon mm. only ever once and and it, it i couldn't communicate with it it was just it was just there physically and it was only there for a few seconds and then all the other dragons that i work with it's more like you say it's telepathic or it's on a shamanic journey where i'm in an upper realm or a lower realm or i'm in a, another yeah. star system and then they then they seem more physical so yeah mm. that, that does make sense mm. Someone said, uh, have you ever come across the Atlantean dragon forces and a dragon high priest reference in Atlantis? Um, that doesn't sound familiar. Is this person referring to uh, something specific as maybe one person or something like that? Because I don't, don't usually have names or um, uh, characters like in a history that would come up so no sometimes people you know send me email and they say well do you know about that dragon that that is called blah 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 no it's it's too specific yeah so maybe that person is connected to that and she get that name because it was easier for the dragon to give her that name but maybe if that dragon connects to another person he would give another name for another good reason yeah. i couldn't say yeah it makes it yeah i get lots of questions from people at times saying have you heard of this dragon that's like well it's a bit like you saying to me i i used to live in london do you do you know fred bloggs who lives in exactly. North London? It's like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, I might have heard of them, but yeah, and, and there's, <laughs> there's so many of them, isn't there? Sometimes we, yeah, sometimes we think it's very simple, and there's, there's millions of them. Yeah, it's it's sometimes, them yeah, it sounds familiar. Sometimes there's a dragon that I'm told about, and it sounds familiar, but I'm not sure. It could be the same, could not be not. I don't know. The <laughs> the only dragon that came back um, from one person to another, and those people didn't know about this dragon, and they did didn't know each other. It's the dragon Tiamat. Mm -hmm. Do you know about her? You probably know about her. Yeah, yeah, heard of yeah. her. So it's it's the only one that came up this way. Makes sense. All right, so is any more questions here? Somebody says, do you know what the connection is between dragons and cats? Ah, good question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I often talk about it. Well, I got this question a lot. And in sessions, we really often see that as dragon can choose to incarnate in a human body, they can choose to partially incarnate in a cat body. So yes, there are a lot of cats uh, that carry this dragon energy. It's not the entire consciousness of the dragon. It's like a fractal. Um, yes. And why cats more than other animals? Well, the answer I get to this question is because is because uh, feline extraterrestrials are dragon riders. Not all of them, but there are a lot of dragon riders that are feline 
So there is a, a, a feeling between those two beings, you see. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm sure, I'm sure my cat's a little dragon. <laughs> <laughs> and someone says, uh, have you written a book? I'd love to hear more. I did, yes, in French only. Um, I want to have it translated in English, but uh, I don't have time to finish the, the job yet. So, But it will be translated in English. In French, it's, it's called, well, the English title would be A Dragon Rider's Chronicles. So this book was started in 2018 and it was published published in 2021. Um, it's actually a two, uh, well, I did the book with another person, how to present that book. If you have read Dolores Cannon's book, you might know about Keepers of the Garden. Keepers of the Garden is a fantastic book, one of my favorites of Dolores Cannon. And uh, she wrote about a man she worked with in session for like two or three years. This guy is called Phil. And um, she, she talks about all the session that they had together. And in August 2018, uh, I met Simon. And this is a very funny story, actually. It was only a year after my after I started working with Dragon through hypnosis. And I, I was in England, actually. I was around Stone Age with my friends and colleagues. And I, talked, I told them about my work with Dragons. I was very shy about it. And they all told me, you have to do something about it. It's really strong. It's amazing. Well, just do something. And I was like, I don't want to be, uh, you know, pretentious or I don't know, I don't know. And I remember I was in the car and I was, I said, okay, universe, if I have to do something with dragons, I want to do it like, like Dolores Cannon did. So just pick someone for me to work with during hypnosis sessions. Next week was the 8th of August, 2018, my first session uh, back from, from England. And I had this amazing session with Simon. It was his first session. He was not actually very spiritual. It, this session was a gift. And at the end of the session, I just heard in my head, ask him, ask him, ask him. He's the one, he's the one. So I told him, Simon, uh, I would like to, to work about uh, on dragons. Uh, the, your session was amazing. Uh, would you like to work with me? And uh, he said, yes. And we worked together for a year and we had a session, one session a month because it was quite strong for him. So he needed that time to process the energy. Um, and after 12 session, we wrote the book. So actually, technically I did not write the book, he did because every session was recorded and then I sent him the records he wanted to, read, to write down the record. And the first time he did that, he intuitively wanted to sh write about his own experience, <laughs> how it felt to be under hypnosis, how it felt to channel his dragon, how it felt just to um, realize what he was doing, how it felt to have all the doubts, the fears, the intuition, everything. And he sent me the first session written down and I was like wow this is fantastic so I am not the one who's going to write the book you are I thought I was going to be the one as the risk cannon was but no it's so much more strong it's so much stronger when it's written this way so it's 12 session where he um he has written the session and he has added all his commentary holes all his experience, and it's fantastic. It's a book that has had quite a success in France and with French-speaking people, so I'm very happy about that. And, uh, well, I'm just looking for help uh, to have the translation in English, but uh, it's going to be okay. Someone here, I saw Cheryl, thank you. I want to thank Cheryl that is here, I think. I saw her name and she helped uh, for the translation, so thank you. Beautiful, I look forward to reading that then. Probably give it to an AI and it'll probably translate it for you. Well, we had we had it translated yet, but I want to have proofreading. Yeah. 
Cool. All right. What other ones we've got? It says, uh, can an angel be a dragon rider or a dragon? And then Marlene said that she's going to expand on that. So maybe maybe we leave her oh, to okay. do that. Okay. Well, yeah. Well, okay. I'm just going to say that, uh, for example, St. Michael is a dragon rider. <laughs> That's it. Cool. Living to Marlene. <laughs> Ooh, nice. <laughs> uh blah 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 and then what have we got uh can you speak to dragons that are connected to mountains and hold the light nodes within the energetic grid of the earth sure you can speak to anything yes just just ask to be connected ask it with your heart with your little child inner child and it's going to work. Beautiful. Has anyone experienced using dragon light language? My experience with that was incredible. Have you ever come across dragon light language? Uh, yes, it happens sometimes. You know, I remember uh, a woman I had in a hypnosis session and she was connecting to a past life as a dragon and she was seeing her eggs um deep deep down at the bottom of a lake uh to protect them because they were um hunted they were being hunted by bad beings and suddenly she told me um i want to say some something but um i don't know what it is <laughs> and i'm just like as usual just let it go and let it out and she started speaking light language mm. hard to say what exactly but you know what i mean it's it was i think my understanding was that it was her language as this dragon yeah that makes sense mm. yeah i've i've heard dragon light language and i've also heard someone actually channeling a dragon and, and they, they were completely different and the, the person oh, was yeah. channeling dragon was very very sort of husky deep voice and then the, the light mm. language is more sort of floaty and bird song mm. completely different yeah i actually heard different light language that uh i would say came from dragons <laughs> my my personal experience when i channel light language which is quite rare when i do it it's only for myself not ready to share it to the world yet <laughs> <laughs> sorry but when i uh channel light language i think well i found I, I found that it looks like uh kind of japanese sometimes and no i know i am connected to lemuria energy and i connected with past life in in that period so it's a strong energy i carry Mm -hmm. So I think this light language came from that time as a dragon. But then there are uh, people that channel as dragon, that channel other light language from other places. I would say that every light language as dragon is different. Yeah, yeah that, makes, that makes sense. It's, I mean, if you just think about our planet, how many different languages there are and how many different accents there are, it would make yeah. sense. The dragons are, are all different as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's a follow up to the mountain question. It says, uh, what are your thoughts about dragons in the mountains? Mm. Um, it's not a topic that I've been working on specifically, but now that you talk about it, there are two examples that come to my mind. First one would be dragons that are keepers of the place, keepers of the, of the earth, the territory. The mountain and, and it's fine everything's all right and dragons is just you know doing what it has to do here and recently i've heard uh, a very sad story uh, about a dragon that was trapped under a mountain and on the top of that mountain happened to be a monastery and this dragon was trapped there it was not even conscious of what was happening because this dragon was um, under black magic so it was attacked actually and the monastery was kind of keeping that energy 
so the dragon would not wake up. So that's an example. And then, you know, it, it will happen what has to happen, but it, this exists as well. There are also some sad stories with dragons that I've heard a lot. Well, not only in Atlantis with uh, the massacres and everything, but also with what we call dragon magic. Um, dragon magic has a sad story as well because dragon wanted to share with us humans here on Earth, but also on other planets in Lyra, for example, again, uh, they wanted to share with us their knowledge, uh, their magic. Magic, as I understand it, is only mostly knowledge, energy, etc. They wanted to share it with us, but unfortunately, there were some humans, there were some beings that want to want wanted to have more, more power, more ego, more stuff, more anything as we know today. And so it was another kind of treason, of treason. So today, um, when, when the dragon I connect with talk to me about dragon magic, they are very careful. They always remember us to connect with human magic first, with earth magic first, and that they are here. And if it's, if it's okay, they can share with us some bits of their knowledge, bits of their magic. But some of the dragon will be very, um, what would be the word, you know, when you're not trusting someone entirely. So they won't give everything. So dragon magic can be um, a sensitive subject as well. Uh, sometimes I, you know, I get messages about people that say I want to connect with dragon magic, etc. And I always get this the same sensation in my body and in my mind as if my dragon was like, tell him or tell her to be careful, just be careful and focus on your own magic. Human magic is already amazing and already very powerful. So this was another topic. I wanted to talk about. I've heard that one as well. Um, what, why, why as a human do you want dragon magic? I've heard yeah. that as well from my dragons. That leave yeah. the dragon magic to the dragons. Us dragons exactly. don't do human magic. So yeah. you humans, you do your magic. We don't do ours. Exactly. It's, yeah, and it, and they're complementary. Um, mm. Somebody saying, can you release dragons from under monasteries? Um, yeah, there was somebody else has said something about. I can't believe that actually dragons could ever have been captured, but we have to remember that we're talking about times where humanity and the dark forces were had a stronger magic. So there's, there's, they, they could easily capture them. I, yeah. I, I've released a few, a friend of mine released a few dragons. I know Alexandra um, initially releases dragons and, and it's a topic that we've not discussed in a huge amount, but there is a, a talk on it uh, on a, mm -hmm another podcast which uh, I'll share when I share this so people can listen to that I think we were talking for a couple of hours about how yeah. you can release dragons and it is it, it's, it's it's possible um, yeah you just and, use, and, your, yeah. You use your your human magic and the dragons that are assisting you use the dragon magic and between the two of you you can work out how to release them but yeah you can't yeah. release them all because sometimes the magic that's been put in place to capture them is so strong you're not able to Yes, and it's and sometimes it's just not our place to do it. Sometimes yeah. the dragon would need uh, to do it himself mm -hmm. uh, in the time, in the good time. Sometimes the dragon would need his dragon rider, yeah. and no one else. So it's always um, specific to the dragon, specific to the human. I'm um, doing the session with, for example, and uh, unfortunately, yes, there are a lot of dragon that are still trapped. Um, and in the sessions I do, we also do this kind of work. For example, when someone reconnects to the fact that he or she is a dragon rider, um, there's a, a, a scene that is like a pattern. The, the, my client would see himself 
in kind of a, a cave or something that is underground with uh, rooms and narrow um, alley, very dark. And the, well, the people, the, the person knows that he or her dragon is there, but can't seem to find him yet. So we have to wait, we have to do something else during the session, etc. It's also a way for the mental spirit to understand and process that yes, dragons exist, and you are going to see yours. <laughs> and then once the person just finds the right room and uh, he sees her dragons, a dragon inside, and sometimes the dragon is just uh, captured and has something around the neck, something around the wrists, is like imprisoned and sometimes half asleep or just unconscious. So then we have this work together where I uh, accompany my client, I lead them to, for example, touch the dragon gently and say, I am here and I, 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 I love you. Uh, it's okay, you are safe, it's all over, and you can wake up, etc., etc. Anything that comes to my mind at that moment and that anything that comes to the mind of my client at that moment. And then little by little, the dragon is released. So for, for this example of the dragon that is trapped under the mountain with the monastery on top, well, in the session I had, it was not, uh, actually, we just uh, had a glimpse of that story. It was not the main topic of the session, but I guess someone could go and try to help, but it seemed to be a, something very big where it would necessitate a lot of people to help. Makes sense. There are these people saying now. Yeah. Yeah, people are asking, can you have bad dragons? Oh, good question. Um, I often say that I found in my work three kinds of bad dragons. Uh, first one, and um, I'm going to make it quick because I, I see the time is running. First one would be the dragon that is so hurt that it has just, you know, uh, what would you say in English when you are going crazy and just killing everyone because you're so crazy, you, your brain just popped out, you know. <laughs> so this is the most of the time the mean dragons I can see. Most dragons, well, a lot of, a lot of dragons have been hurt. Um, they have seen their family killed. They have been massacred. They have seen their dragon riders massacred at some point. So they just went crazy and said, okay, you humans are just kids that didn't, didn't understand anything. Now you're going to see me crazy. You're going to see me mad. You're going to see me blow everything out. And when you're outside the scene, you could say, okay, this dragon is very mean. He's going to kill everyone. He's burning everyone, etc." So that's a kind of mean dragon. But then you understand when you go a bit deeper, you understand that this dragon is just so hurt. And then when he um, calms down, he just knows what he did and he feels so guilty. And that there is a healing uh, process that we have to do together or just to help the dragon do it himself. Second kind of mean dragon would be, um, let me think. Oh, black magic or dragonic magic that has been corrupted and turned up against the dragons. So, for example, uh, when the dragons shared their knowledge with mages, with sorcerers, etc. And those sorcerers wanted to have more and more and more up until the moment they had so much power, they could trap the dragons to their own magic. See, see what I mean? Is that, does that make sense? Okay. And at that moment, they, they could have dragons do anything. So that could also be a reason for mad, mean dragons. They are just, um, brainwashed. Third kind is 
um, consciously evil dragon. <laughs> I would say that. It's not the most uh, of dragons I met. And I remember there was a session where my client saw himself as a dragon that was very dark. He was um, punishing slaves for being too slow, etc. And my client was like, wow, <laughs> I'm not a good dragon. What, what's happening? So we stopped uh, to that scene and I asked him to focus on his own dragon, uh, maybe, even if he was a mean dragon. And I told him, focus on his heart. What do you see? And then he just told me, I see light. And I'm like, yeah, okay, because it's a dragon, actually. So there is always light. And I asked to talk with this dragon, so through my clients. And this dragon just told me that he knows what he's doing. He just cho chose this incarnation. He knows he's, he's evil. He knows he's doing harm to people. But he's here because he has to learn stuff. And people are suffering, unfortunately, because they have to learn stuff. But what was really interesting, it was that this dragon was as if he was still connected to his higher consciousness, which is different with us humans because we have our own personality and if we are not looking for it, we would stay like this. We would not try to connect with our higher self. We feel like we are separated with our higher self. This dragon, and for me, well, I, I found that in my work, every dragon I talked to are always connected to their higher parts, higher self. So this um, negative dragon was, but consciously, see? I find this very interesting. That makes sense. I think some humans are the same though, aren't they? I think some yeah. people, humans are just playing a part there. Their higher mm -hmm. self said, you've got to go down there and do this because yeah. you need to stir the humans up. They, they, you know, they need some yeah. pain to wake up or whatever it is. Yeah. And most of us humans are mean to other people or to ourselves because we are suffering mm -hmm. also. And, you know, this is the first type of dragons I see that those dragons that are mean because they are suffering. As for us humans, most of us, when we are mean, it's because we are suffering. True. Beautiful. I think we've come to the end of the questions. I'm sure people will type them in there. Um, okay. Virginia, thank you for sharing all your beautiful knowledge. I'm, thank you. I'm sure everyone will send you lots of love. There's that you can, if you go down the bottom, there's a thing where you can send lots of hearts. So it's called reactions. So if you want to send a beautiful love heart, say thank you for the, the thank talk. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Please, please do hang around if if you've got time. But if you're yes, I will. Cool. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, awesome. everyone. There's lots of thanks. So merci, merci beaucoup. Merci. That's how you say. <laughs> <Oui>. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you.